Hey Internet, welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. On this week's episode of Ask the Pastor 2.0, we're gonna take your questions about eternal, eternal damnation. damnation. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Yeah. But like, seriously, it's not funny and I shouldn't make fun of it. Cause it's crazy stuff, you right? Right, 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 ready, ready, ready? All right, here we go. <laughs> but first, it's time for your issues, etc. question of the week. Pastor Fisk, I am having a crisis of faith over this issue of inerrancy. I have compared six different accounts of the resurrection and the ascension, and they're loaded with discrepancies. I see no way to reconcile them. Thanks for your help. This is also a pretty decent question and not an uncommon one for those raised in fundamentalism or even fundamentalist-leaning Lutheranism to have when they start to look carefully at the text of Scripture. Sometimes when people do this, they start to see the different perspectives given in the witnesses of the accounts that took place as not being perspectives, but as discrepancies or even errors, seeming contradictions. Now, you're not the first person to face this problem, nor will you be the last, especially when you're bringing a modern mindset to it as a people like trained in printing press style reproduction of words, which just isn't a reality for oral cultures like that of the New Testament. No one had video footage to go look at, right? But just because one person calls something a tomato when someone else calls it a tomato, let's call the whole thing off, doesn't necessarily mean that either of them wrong. Huh? There's a lot of great resources for you on this topic. A great book to get a copy of is William Arndt's Bible Difficulties and Seeming Contradictions. Check the link below. I also heavily recommend F.F. Bruce's work, The Canon of Scripture, and both Carson Moo and Morris's Introduction to the New Testament and Dillard Longman's Introduction to the Old Testament for sections that deal with the history and development of the texts that we have. And then you got all sorts of bad resources that I don't recommend you buy, like McConville's Exploring the Old Testament, which comes at it from the start with an assumption there's no such thing as actual prophecy and that all prophecies about things that happened were actually written after they happened. I mean, it's gonna end up in a bad place, you know? But if you're not ready to go buy a book, you can listen to the below linked episodes from Issues Etc., including an episode that deals with the so-called discrepancies in the resurrection accounts. The links we've posted below go to the Issues Etc. website, where you will find an episode that discusses the resurrection account for each gospel. Four links, four gospel accounts. Though you may have to scroll through a little bit because we couldn't find direct links to each episode, you can listen to the discussion on each gospel account of the resurrection. For the person who wants answers to these questions and isn't just playing the skeptic, I think you will find this a helpful starting point for wrestling with taking the gospels from the starting point of where the gospels want to give you something, rather than starting with the assumptions of the postmodern skeptical godless man. Eh, which is what our culture basically does. Eh, sad for us. <laughs> Email. Pastor Fisk, what is the Lutheran perspective on annihilation? How do you explain the repeated usage of words like perishing, death, destruction to describe the wicked and everlasting life and live forever and whatnot explicitly for those who trust in Jesus? All right, first thing I want to say is that while I guess in our postmodern times you can talk about the Lutheran perspective, it's not really what we're in the business of talking about as Lutherans. We don't talk about our perspective, although we certainly have an heritage or a tradition of interpreting the Bible, but we would still say it's not really our point of view so much as what we believe the Bible actually says, right? And really all traditions should think this way about what they say their position is. Otherwise they're just kind of, it's kind of weird to say my perspective is only my perspective and is not actually true, but I'm going to say that it's true. Right. It's just kind of a weird place to be, right? So it's not what is the Lutheran perspective, but what do Lutherans believe the Bible says about, say, annihilationism or eternal damnation counter against each other? Now, as a heads up, for those of you who don't know, annihilationism is generally thought of as the idea that there is no hell. There is rather simply like a final punishment that is over with for those who do not believe in Jesus. So damnation doesn't mean like eternal damnation, but is instead a matter of ceasing to exist or some such thing, similar in some ways to 
of what the Buddhists think of heaven. Well, isn't that special? Weird as that might be, yeah? All right, so rather than try to like simply come up with this answer on my own, I thought this would be one of those great chances I've been looking for recently to go back and dig a little and pull out the venerable and devout Dr. Francis Peeper's nice Christian dogmatic. So that's what we're going to be doing today. I'm going to be paraphrasing and more or less mentally translating it for you, but from time to time you might catch me actually reading with my nose in the book because I'm pretty much just going to be saying what he's saying, yeah? In his entire article on eternal damnation and some of the part on eternal life, which is the end of volume three, the last volume of his dogmatics. So pretty much everybody's conscience more or less convinces them that there's something happening after death. I mean, the atheist tries to deny that, but the natural man knows there's something coming. Now we would say that this knowledge belongs to the realm of the law, that the law is active in the realm of the natural man, knowing that judgment is going to take place, right? Karma, there's repercussions for what you do now, later. Mm, forbidden donut. Well, well, finishing something? This is why, like in ancient paganism, you still see beliefs and things like levels of punishment in Hades, for example. Now, Holy Scripture then teaches the idea of eternal condemnation or damnation so clearly that it's all but impossible to deny it without being like vehemently obstinate and ignoring all the passages and only selecting the ones that you can reinterpret to fit your own whims. You basically have to deny the authority of Scripture to deny the reality of a final and eternal hell. A finite being in a finite segment of time receives infinite punishment that has to be sort of kept up and maintained by God, that says something about the nature of God. Hmm. So let's say a 17-year-old rejects Christ, dies, and 17 million years from now, however you want to say that, that's obviously a sort of over-the-top language, God is still punishing that person. Is God like that? And I think it's a totally legitimate Do you think question. God is like that, Rob? No, I don't okay. think God is like that. What version of the Bible are you reading? I don't think it means what you think it means. Now, there's a couple of ways that we can explain this, but one is that there is always a parallel between hell itself and the eternal life of the Christian. They go like against each other in opposite form. So that if you're going to deny one, you kind of have to deny the other. For example, Matthew 25, 46, which reads, These, the damned, shall go away to everlasting punishment, but the righteous to everlasting life. So you can't say that one just means annihilation, but the other one actually means eternal life because they're both dealing with opposites of each other. They're, they're parallelized. Not paralyzed, parallelized. <laughs> you find this juxtaposition in other places like John 3.36. But it basically means that you can never take the term eternity and redefine it to mean not eternity, but a limited time. Unless you're going to also say that we're not going to live for eternity. So that when you come to that word eternity, as it's used in scripture, it pretty much has to always mean for so in 2 Thessalonians 1 9, when it talks about everlasting destruction, in Matthew 18 8, when it talks about everlasting fire, in Mark 3 29, when it talks about eternal damnation, you kind of have to take those words to mean what those words actually just normally mean and not strip them of their meaning to make it fit what seems to you like a nicer, more palatable thing to believe. No, I don't okay. think God is like that. that may in fact be able to be read into other texts, but has to then therefore deny these texts. And that's always the issue when you run into texts that maybe seem like they're against each other. They're not against each other, they actually go hand in hand. But perhaps the reading of one of them over against the other does make it seem that way. So the Lutheran would say that the texts which talk about eternal damnation by talking about things like perishing and death don't get rid of the perishing and the death, it just is lined up with and parallel to the eternal damnation. Now, the objections raised in every Every age against the infernal punishment are understandable from a human perspective because the very thought of a never-ending agony imposed upon rational beings fully then able to recognize their distressing plight is so appalling so terrifying that it exceeds human comprehension I mean that's what he says isn't that amazing that he says that that's like fantastic stuff there I'd quote the German that it's got if I could pronounce German mein ganz erschrockness ers erbet das mir die Zung am Gammen you're making random noises with your mouth and then hoping 
that some of them are words. Would you believe I'm German by heritage? Look at that monkey! Yeah. But all objections to the eternal infernal are based on the false principle that it is proper and reasonable to make our human sentiments and judgments the measure of who God is and what God's going to do. That is, we get to judge God based on what we think ought to be right. This is especially true for those that contend that an everlasting punishment does not line up with either divine love or divine justice, who would then want to substitute for eternal punishment either some gradual form of getting out of it, aka purgatory, or some later annihilation of the wicked. Against this, we have to first and foremost maintain that God's attributes, who he is, is beyond our comprehension, and that we cannot of our own a priori just know what he would do, but must get it from his revealed word, what he actually has said to us he's going to do. So the actual nature of eternal punishment consists in this, banishment from God, being forever excluded from any communion with God at all. So Christ says in Matthew 25, 41, depart from me, and they shall be cast out into darkness, Matthew 8, 12. See, because man is made for God, and living in communion with God is actually supreme joy and a total delight, so banishment from his presence must result in unbearable suffering to both body and soul. So to describe this horrid state of damnation, scripture uses a variety of terms, but all of them express the intense agony of the flesh and of the spirit. Tribulation and anguish in Romans 2. Being in torments, Luke 16. Tormented in this fire, again, Luke 16. The fire that shall never be quenched and the worm that dieth not, Mark 9. Weeping and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 8 and 13. To illustrate this horrible agony, ancient theologians compared it to being a fish removed from water. But there is this difference that the fish removed from water soon dies, whereas the man removed from communion from God by God's judgment is guilty of eternal judgment. Now there's questions that arise like, are there actually going to be worms there? And you can debate that point, and the Lutheran theologians have done this. You can also debate the point whether or not they're going to continue sinning, or whether they're going to be bound in such a way that they can't do that. And to be sure, there are passages of scripture that do teach there's even degrees of torment. Matthew 11, 22, that it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for, well, you, the people Jesus was talking to, the Jews who did not receive him, who should have, because he was their Christ and all, right? The severest judgment is reserved for those who reject the gospel having been preached to them in the purest measure. Christ testifies to this in Matthew 11, 16 to 24 with regards to Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum. You can also get into debates about where locally hell will actually be, but most Orthodox theologians simply speak of it as being somewhere. Leading theologians and church fathers wisely say we should not concern ourselves over so much determining the placement of hell as rather with escaping it. So Chrysostom, we search not where it is, but how we may flee. It. Conversely to this, and over against this, you have the fact of eternal life purchased by the blood atonement of Christ Jesus our Lord. The reality is that God doesn't want anybody to be eternally punished. That's not his plan, that's not his proper work, that's not his goal, it's not why he created us, unless you're a Calvinist. I know you guys hate it when I call you out, but seriously, mm, that's not why he created us. He created us for life, and so Jesus came that we might be restored to life after we willingly and free willingly rejected it. So we know that there is an eternal life, and that all who are in Christ will come to know and be with God forever, to behold him as he is in Jesus, and to thus enjoy unspeakable and bodily bliss. But this too we have as a revelation strictly through his word, through the gospel, the good news of Christ himself, who he is, what he's done. Think second article to the creed. The natural theology of man knows nothing of this kind of heaven or salvation, even though it might speak of states of bliss that it can get to by its works. Natural theology knows nothing of the Son of God who took on flesh for our sin, who vicariously satisfied God's wrath in our place. So we shouldn't mistake the pagan teaching of the immortality of the soul for the Christian doctrine of eternal life and the resurrection of the body. Paul himself declares that all Gentiles and scholars who, like Plato, have have made a special study of the immortality of the human spirit, just kind of of its own accord, have no hope. Ephesians 2, 12. The only true hope of eternal life is through Christ Jesus, the man who defeated death. What is this eternal life going to be like? It's going to be being with God in the new creation, restored in and from the man who is not of dust but of heaven, Jesus himself. So while now believers can know God through his word and his sacraments, there he will reveal himself without the veil, face to face, immediately even. Scripture clearly teaches 
teaches that this such beholding of God is divine and unspeakable bliss. It will transfigure everything, period. Remember Jesus on the mountain when his clothing no longer cast shadows, but instead cast light. Imagine if your soul received that glory. So John says in 1 John chapter 3, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, but what we shall be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Now, participation of our very bodies, which have shared in the tribulations here in the present, in this coming bliss of heaven, is evidenced not only by clear testimonies from scripture, but also then by the fact that your body is of the essence of you as a human. That this body will be a spiritual body is a somewhat unknown and unexplained state statement of Paul, best thought of as similar to the glorified body of Christ, perfect, immortal, filled with strength and beauty, because sin, the cause of decay, is just gone from it. Now, there will be no degrees of bliss in the same sense that there were degrees of torment in heaven, although there will be degrees of glory. And this is a fascinating thing. God will continue to show forth a design unto creation, and there will be, well, authority itself in heaven. And some of us are going to be up, and some of us are going to be down, but of course, we'll also know, like, from the heart, that the first is last and the last is first. So the guy at the bottom is actually the guy who's the most blessed, which is kind of like counter to us. We can't even fathom that now. You can read up on more of that in here too, if you want. But in closing then, let's just come back to this idea of annihilation and try to address it really succinctly. All arguments for annihilationism are not based on clear passages of scripture, but based on the human reason that hell is too horrible a thing to believe that God would do. And so using our reason, we ignore what scripture actually says and impose on God our own definitions of love and justice. Wait, doesn't my father have the right to a fair trial? Oh, you Americans with your due process and fair trials. To be sure, the scripture does use terms like eternal death, like forever death, to describe what eternal damnation is, but that's not the only phrase that's used. And unless you want to strip eternal life of its eternal ongoing reality, then you cannot remove the counter type, the counter parallel, the juxtaposed reality of eternal damnation as being a living death and an everlasting and ongoing continual destruction. And yeah, it's a horrible idea. It's, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible idea. It's sin. It's how evil we really are. And that too is part of our problem. We don't really want to believe how evil we really are. That we actually do deserve not just to be killed and like get out of it, but to be bound to it and kept in it forever as its own punishment. That's how bad we are. And since we don't want to believe that and we want to believe that, you know, we can kind of like soften God up too. And, and I begin with the assumption that God is love and that God's love is a vast, wide, expansive, indestructible reality. And we create these impositions upon scripture that make us deny the clear sayings of Jesus himself that the fire will not die and the worm will not cease to bite in that horrible, horrible place. Hey, but see, this is just the thing. Thanks be to God, he took it on for us here so that you have nothing to worry about and you being you plural like the entire world. The only reason you gotta worry is if you don't wanna believe it. If you don't wanna believe it, you're crazy. <laughs> you're crazy, it's free, salvation life, you know. Uh, anyway, I gotta go. My day is just about over. But thanks for tuning in. And if you like what we do here at Worldview Everlasting, you can always, you know, like the videos and subscribe to the channel and uh, join the Wee Dojo. You don't know what the Wee Dojo is? Call Peter. What's the Wee Dojo? You tell him about the Wee Dojo somehow with your magic mystical stuff? What's that over there? I'll answer that question in seven years when you're ready. Come on, tell me. Oh, all right. That's the Wee TV Dojo. And join the Lutheran Ninja Clan. $5 a month helps this show do what it does. You will not believe how much more we can do once we get to the point that Project Awesome is going to take off. So yeah, more about that in the links below. Until next time, look forward to eternal life in Jesus when he comes back where we will all eternally rock on. Excellent. So you like donuts, eh? Mm -hmm. Well, have all the donuts in the world! <laughs> More. I don't understand it. James Coco went mad in 15 minutes.